Uh, last week, we ended our discussion talking briefly about the uh, Day of Atonement. And uh, it will again be a part of today's lesson as we go through the seven feasts of Israel. Uh, and the seven feasts that we're talking about are the ones found in Leviticus, the chapter of uh, the book of Leviticus. Uh, and there were seven of them. There was one added later uh, after Esther called Purim. Uh, but that's not going to be a part of our discussion. <clears throat> Here we have the, the seven feasts listed with their Hebrew name and the scripture where you can find the Lord's instructions concerning that particular feast. And in the right column, the date for the feast is given along with a corresponding <coughs> Gregorian calendar date for 2019. And, and I just selected 2019 for the purpose of reference because uh, in, on our calendar, those dates slide. They move, but on the Hebrew calendar, they do not. So I just selected a particular year and just to give you an idea about when it falls and the time of the year. <clears throat> They're not, <clears throat> of course, not on the same day every year, on, it, just like Easter. Easter moves around on our calendar. Uh, so why is that? Why is that that they, they, they slide back and forth? It's because the Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar and the Gregorian calendar is based on uh, the sun or revolutions around the, around the earth, the, or the earth's revolutions around the sun, I should say. <coughs> so the Hebrew calendar is, is based on phases of the moon rather than the earth's revolution around the sun. Each month starts with a new moon. Everybody knows what a new moon is, right? New moon is no moon. Uh, and reaching the full moon in the, in the middle of the month, about the 15th day of the month, will be the full moon. It always Passover, the first one, always starts on uh, the first full moon after in spring. When spring begins, the first full moon is Passover. And uh, the moon makes a much better calendar than the sun. The moon changes every night. So if you're familiar with the phases of the moon and you watch it, uh, every night that it's a clear night, you can you can tell what day of the month it is by what stage the moon is in. And and uh, those folks back in in biblical times could do that. In the Hebrew reckoning, the day begins at sunset. Uh, in other words, the, the 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 first day of the month would be at sunset, or you might say moonrise. Uh, so that differs from our our perspective as well because we we tend to start our day at 6 a.m. or or you know in the morning or some people consider it a new day you know after midnight uh, clockwise and one might wonder how the ancient Hebrew people let me let me, let me point out a verse to you though first like uh, the, the, the beginning of the day. And it, it seems as though from this scripture that that was God's idea as well. Because he says, and there is evening and there was morning the first day. So it began with evening and it ended with morning in Genesis 1-5. And he repeated that phrase uh, numerous times in the early part of Genesis. And you might wonder how these ancient uh, uh, Hebrew people would know when to celebrate Passover. You know, we've already talked about, you know, what Passover is and what, uh, what started it all. So 
but God constituted Passover as to be a feast that would be celebrated annually in remembrance of uh, his saving them or their exodus from Egypt and uh, saving them on the night of the, the tenth and final plague where he took all the firstborn. So we know that's what Passover is. So how would, how would the ancient Hebrew people know when the 15th of the first month of the Hebrew calendar was because uh, yeah, I mean, you can see it would be a kind of a difficult task for somebody living out in the desert wandering around living in tents but notice this that in, in Israel the almond tree blooms in a beautiful white blossom at the end of winter so when they they saw the almond tree blooming then they would notice the moon at that time and they could tell that the first full moon after the almond tree blossoms is Passover so they would know you know when the almond tree bloomed that you know they could look at the moon and say well it's another 12 days before full moon. They would know, get ready, start preparing for Passover. <coughs> Passover is the first of the seven feasts and mark the beginning of, of what's called the, uh, the, the year of the feast. It's the first feast and it marks the beginning of the year for them, uh, feast-wise. And it also is in the first month the month called Nisan. <clears throat> In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. Leviticus 23, 5. So on the first day of the month, on the first month, rather on the 14th day of the month, which should be full moon, that'd be halfway through the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. What is the meaning of Passover to Christians? It surely is the feast of salvation. We've already seen where the Passover lamb typifies Christ, our Passover lamb. The feast commemorates the day in Egypt when the Israelites sacrificed the lamb without spot or blemish and smeared the blood from that lamb on their doorpost and the angel of death passed over that house because of that blood. So do you think it was mere coincidence that our Lord Jesus was sacrificed on Passover? At the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus himself stated, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 28. John the Baptist clearly marked out the person of Jesus as the blood sacrifice when he stated, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. As Christians, we celebrate Passover in effect by participating in the sacrifice of the Lord by Holy Communion. Back in Egypt, the Jew marked his house with the blood of the lamb. Today, the Christian marks his house, his body, the house of the Holy Spirit with the blood of Christ. Those with the doorpost of their houses marked with the blood of Christ will be passed over by the angel of death just as he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. You see, we are already living our eternal life. If the doorpost of our hearts are marked with the blood of the Lamb of God, we will never die. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, fulfilled the feast of Passover on the exact day 
We will see this for each of the feasts. The Lord fulfills them all, all of them. Passover then represents our salvation. We do not keep this feast in remembrance of the exodus of Egypt or from Egypt since that was a mere shadow of the greater redemption to come. The Lord himself instructed us, do this in remembrance of me. We do take communion, a part of the original Passover feast in remembrance of our Lord. The Passover feast lasts for seven days. And on the next night, we have a feast, the feast of unleavened bread. In other words, on the eighth day, the next night, after Passover is ended. On the 15th day of the last month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. Leviticus 23, 6. God instructed the Hebrews to eat only pure unleavened bread during the week following Passover. Leaven or yeast in the Bible symbolizes sin or evil. Unleavened bread eaten over a seven day period uh, symbolizes a holy walk with God. The Apostle Paul commented on the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, with which he was quite familiar. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8. The unleavened bread of the New Testament is, of course, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is described as the bread of life. He was born in Bethlehem the house of bread. He utilizes bread as an image of himself. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John 12, 24. God fed the Israelites in the wilderness with manna from heaven. And he feeds the Christians in the world today with the bread of life. The very piece of bread the Hebrews used during this week of unleavened bread is a picture of Christ. And I brought some with me. Okay, you can see, this is called matzah. This is uh, the, the unleavened bread they're talking about. And, and notice the stripes in the, in the matzah. By his stripes, we are healed. And you see the holes in it. As through, as, as though it was just pierced. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And of course it's pure. It's without leaven or yeast. Just as his body was without sin. In the modern Jewish celebration of the Passover. <clears throat> there are three pieces of, of matzah. Or three loaves. And here we have in the...
and they would be wrapped in a white linen such as this and you can see there are three loaves <coughs> and what does that what does that remind you of the trinity three okay here we, this gets more interesting so we got father son and holy spirit <clears throat> in the course of the ceremony during what's called the seder dinner or the passover celebration the leader takes the middle piece which represents what the sun then he takes that middle piece and he wraps it in a white linen and he buries it under the table or someplace where it was hidden or buried. Just, you know, somewhere out of sight. And then near the end of the celebration or the Seder, the children are given <clears throat> the task of finding this hidden piece of matzah or buried piece of matzah. And it, it, it's kind of a game to entertain the children. But here's, here's, the, uh, here's the kicker to it. When it's found, it is unwrapped and declared to be the dessert, or in Hebrew, the apicomen, which means after the meal, or dessert. This ceremony, unbeknown to the Jews, presents the gospel message right in the midst of the Jewish celebration. You see, God performed this exact ceremony <coughs> with the burial of Jesus, our precious broken piece of unleavened bread. More importantly, he did it on the same exact day of the feast. Once again, the requirements of the feast were fulfilled in a remarkable and unmistakable way. Jesus' body was buried in the tomb at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Since his body was interred at sundown on Passover, that was the beginning of a new day. So it was the day after Passover had ended, so it was the first day of unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread. <clears throat> Our grain of wheat was indeed placed in the ground. And at the appropriate moment, it was to rise again or sprout out of the ground and produce much fruit. Much fruit. And friends, when that, when that grain of wheat rose out of the ground, he produced a multitude of fruit and he's still producing fruit today there, there's never been a, a human being on the face of the earth that has made as much difference in our world as jesus christ he is the king of kings For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. <coughs> I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. It's Levite, I'm reading the wrong scripture. Speak to the people of... <coughs> Excuse me. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you will bring the sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheep before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Leviticus 23, 10 and 11. Now God wanted a special feast 
during which the Israelites would acknowledge the fertility of the fine land he had given them. They were to bring the early crop of their spring planting, first fruits, to the priest at the temple to be waived before the Lord on their behalf. This was to be done the day after the Sabbath or a Sunday. This is the day we have come to call Easter. So it is the same day that we call Easter, okay? Although I much prefer Resurrection Day. We miss a very important biblical truth by not referring to it as either first fruits or uh, Resurrection Day. First implies, if it's first fruits, it implies a second, a third, a fourth, you know, so on and so forth. On which indeed it did occur on the day of first fruits. But even more so, the, re the resurrection of the entire church is implied from this. Because he was first, there has to be a second. You follow my train of thought? <clears throat> we shall all be resurrected and go on to be with the Lord in heaven, each in his own order. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23. Paul here makes it very clear the purpose and the real point of the feast. The resurrection of the Lord himself is happy news indeed and worthy of celebration. But we are not surprised by it. After all, the Lord could raise the dead himself. He walked on water. He is the Son of God. The real miracle is that each of us, ordinary mortal sinners, will experience this resurrection. Now how simple it all is if we understand these feasts. And, and Jesus fulfilled each one of them. And he celebrated the Sunday of the week of his crucifixion by rising from the dead. It was not some other day he chose for his resurrection, but the very, very day of first fruits. Just as he performed on Passover and unleavened bread, Jesus even presented his offering of first fruits to the Father. The tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Matthew 27, 52 through 53. So that act right there was Jesus presenting to God his first fruits. In other words, the first people that, he, that were resurrected following him. I mean, that's a key word in that tomb is that in the coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they went into the holy city. So the Lord waved his first fruits before the Lord. First fruits was the last of the feast the Lord was seen personally fulfilling while he was on earth. But his ministry to the church was to go on. Of course, in the ensuing feast, and again, each on its appropriate day, we now turn to the fourth feast to be held 50 days after first fruits. Pentecost. 
God gave very specific instructions for counting the proper number of days until the Feast of Harvest, which it was called, or the Feast of Weeks. And then we call it Pentecost. It was not called Pentecost in, in the, the Bible times. It was called either the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. It actually marked the summer harvest, the second of the year, in which many more crops were available than at first fruits, but still not as many as would be forthcoming in the great fall harvest. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord, Leviticus 23, 15 and 16. So you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So you count seven Sabbaths, which fall on our Saturday, and it's the day after that, again, a Sunday. So, you count seven Sabbaths from first fruits, and then it's the day after the seventh Sabbath. So again, like I said, it's a Sunday. Up until now, we have been kind of skimming over these instructions God is giving us for these verses in Leviticus. We have mostly been looking at the when the feast is celebrated, but there are a couple of verses in, in Leviticus 23 regarding Pentecost that I want to take a closer look at. Leviticus 23, 17. You shall bring from your dwelling place two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. This subtle instruction indicates a great truth. These two wave loaves are of equal weight and they are baked with leaven. They are called first fruits. Since they are baked with leaven, they represent sinful man. These two loaves certainly would not represent any part of the triune Godhead. And since they are first fruits, they are redeemed or resurrected men, it is certainly plausible that God was indicating his plan to include two parts, Jew and Gentile, in his church. You know, we tend to think of the church today as being holy Gentile, holy with a W-H-O-L. But... That was certainly not true of the early church, and it's not true today. The church has always been made up of both Jew and Gentile, since the Lord inevitably retains a remnant of his people. The greater body of Jews will join the church in the kingdom at the second coming, when all Israel will be saved. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in that way, all Israel will be saved as it is, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards for election, 
they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Also, in the instruction of Leviticus 23, we find another peculiar and interesting instruction in verse 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor as for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God, Leviticus 22, 23, 22. Now some of the poor who ate from the corners of the fields that were left unharvested according to the law were Jesus and his disciples in Matthew 12, 1. After his resurrection, the Lord rejoined his disciples and taught them for 40 days, Acts 1, 3. And then he instructed them to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit did come exactly on the day of the feast, Acts 2.1, and gathered a harvest of 3,000 souls. Now how encouraging this must have been for uh, a handful of Christians that were gathered there and, and waiting, they were waiting fearfully for the Lord's promise of the Comforter or the Holy Spirit. Now just think about Peter. Just seven short weeks ago, he denied that he even knew the Lord three times. Now he was able to preach the mighty doctrine of Pentecost and clearly quoted from the prophet Joel and Psalms. And he led a massive crowd of Jews to the Lord Jesus. And the fulfillment of this feast was exactly in keeping with the purpose of the feast. It was a greater harvest of souls than the Lord had presented at first fruits, but only a token of the great harvest to come at the rapture of the church. The 3,000 was a significant number as exactly, exactly 3,000 were killed at the base of Mount Sinai after the golden calf incident. The letter kills and the spirit gives life. It must have been a major argument of the disciples following Pentecost as they witnessed to the Jews that the feast had been fulfilled in remarkable fashion. In that momentous year, whatever they may have thought previously of the teachers uh, of the teacher from Galilee they certainly had to admit this was more than coincidental he was crucified on passover buried on unleavened bread raised on first fruits and sent the holy spirit on pentecost four coincidences are rather difficult to explain, especially when they are so completely appropriate to its purpose. The same situation applies today because we have not yet seen the fulfillment of feast number five. We remain under the orders of Pentecost, continuing the summer crop cultivation. We remain workers in the field until that day of the great harvest, which is marked by the next feast, trumpets. God seems to have enjoyed the trumpet. Ever since Isaac was spared by virtue of a ram being caught in a thicket by its horn, <clears throat> the trumpet, or in biblical times, the ram's horn, was special to God. After all, without Isaac, we would not have had the Jews. And without the Jews, we would not have had the Bible, the apostles, the disciples, 
and we most we must suppose the Messiah himself. God actually seemed to enjoy hearing the trumpets blown, and he used them to great effect when Joshua conquered Jericho. He also specified their use in the year of Jubilee in Leviticus 25, 8 through 10. Having the trumpets proclaim, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Now that quotation from Leviticus appears on the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. It may reassure those that feel that this country was not founded by Bible reading men that it in fact was. But even previous to Jericho, God instructed Moses about trumpets on Mount Sinai in regard to the fifth feast. Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with the blast of a trumpet, a holy convocation. Leviticus 23, 24. Notice that we have skipped over a considerable length of time between uh, Pentecost and trumpets. The first three feasts took place within the first month. Usually that month would be April, and then Pentecost was in early summer, that would usually be May. Trumpets now takes place on the first day of Tishri, or the seventh month which fall about September on our calendar. This jump in time would seem to represent the church age in God's planning, or in other words, the time between the resurrection and the second coming, or the time of the rapture. The Feast of Trumpets unquestionably represents the rapture. The trumpet was the signal for the field workers to come in to the temple and worship. The high priest actually stood on the parapet of the temple wall and blew the trumpet or shofar. That could be heard in all the surrounding fields and at that instant the faithful Jew would stop his harvesting even if there were more crops to harvest, he would stop immediately and leave immediately and go to the worship services. The Lord actually used this image in the Gospel of Matthew. <coughs> Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 24, verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. And we can imagine this scene with a Jew working beside an Arab uh, the Jew would leave and the Arab would likely continue with the harvest. Now, this parallels a believer working beside an unbeliever. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. When that great trumpet sounds, the miracle to surpass all miracles will take place. The living believers will rise from the earth the graves will be <clears throat> give up their dead. All the believers will be mysteriously changed and outfitted for immortality. The triumph of 
mighty Joshua at Jericho is a type of rapture of the church. There, the people shouted and blew the trumpets, and the walls fell down, and each man ascended up into the city. Beautiful Jericho, with its flower gardens and citrus fruits, is a gorgeous oasis in the very arid wilderness. It was a place where God chose to take his people into the promised land. <clears throat> it was their first sight of anything but hopeless desert for some 40 years. Likewise, with the Christians, our glimpse of heaven at the rapture will represent the end of a long journey for each of us through the wilderness. The entire story of Exodus, the story of Passover, our first feast, illustrates the salvation of the believer. First, there was the blood of the lamb which delivered him from death. Then, the trip back through the Red Sea or baptism. Then, the wandering in the wilderness, life here on earth. And finally, Jericho, heaven, when the trumpets sound, I want to show you how closely Joshua 6, 5 compares to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people shall go up. Every one straight before him. Joshua 6, 5. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so... We will always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Now if the Israelites believed they could conquer the mighty Jericho, cross the Jordan, and take the land of the promise, then the Christian can equally believe that he can rise off the earth and meet the Lord in the air. The clincher of the type here is the name of the leader in both cases, Joshua. Jesus' name in Hebrew was Yeshua, which is Joshua in English. Sadly, only a small portion of Jews, the remnant, which is the church at the time of the rapture, will see this magnificent fulfillment. The prophet Jeremiah foresaw this and he lamented over it. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. Jeremiah 8.20 But for the remaining Jews in the world who will not participate in the rapture of the church, God will have a restoration to the promised land. We have seen a portion of the Jews retake the land, of course, in our time. But Isaiah indicates that they will all go back to the sound of a trumpet. In that day, from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain and you will be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day, a great trumpet will be blown. And those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who were driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Isaiah 27, 12 through 13. Now, we, we might suppose... This would be a logical move for Jews left on earth after the church is gone in the tribulation period. The Jewish people 
will hardly have a friend anywhere during that time. And they certainly won't bow to the Antichrist, particularly when he enters the temple, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. And their best defense will be to stand back to back with their brethren in the Holy Land. This is how it will happen, that the Lord will find them all regathered when he returns, Romans 11:26. Trumpets then occur on the seventh new moon of the year, a significant time for the conclusion of an age. The church will be taken out of the world and God will move on the difficult fulfillment <coughs> of the next and most sacred of the Jewish feast, atonement. On the fearsome day of atonement, the Jew literally either lived or died according to God's will. Now on the tenth day of this seventh month in the day of atonement is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. Leviticus 23, 27. Now this was a, <clears throat> a day of confession and it still is. <clears throat> Israel was to individually afflict their souls and be conscious of their national sin. <clears throat> this was the day on which the high priest of Israel entered the fearsome Holy of Holies where God himself dwelt, Leviticus 15. The high priest would make a sacrifice on his behalf and on a sac then a sacrifice on the behalf of all the sins of all the Israelites. It was a most solemn occasion, still treated as the highest of holy days by Jews. We might appreciate some of the difficult laws written right into Leviticus 23, along with the punishments involved with this sacred day. <coughs> and you shall not do any work on that day, that very day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does not work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. Leviticus 23, 28 through 30. For the slightest violation in terms of working that day, lifting something too heavy or, or walking too far, one could be cut off from his people and thus no longer be one of the chosen people. Further trips to the temple would be unnecessary as redemption would then be hopeless. As to the confession time, God specified 24 hours <clears throat> it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest and you shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month beginning at evening from evening to evening shall you keep the Sabbath from evening to evening so that's 24 hours and we might all balk us, we might all balk at the terrible thought of 24 hours of solid confession. But then the Jews were confessing the sins of an entire year. We might even balk at the idea of even staying awake for 24 hours. But if our salvation hung in the balance, we'd try to make it. Such were the blessings and curses of God's own people. From a Jewish perspective, the Feast of Atonement is not fulfilled in the New Testament. This is one feast that is not fulfilled by the church because the church owes no atonement. As Christ paid, he paid the price for our atonement, 
for all our sins. The church is by no means innocent, but fully redeemed by the blood of Christ. The day of atonement will be fulfilled in a wonderful way when Christ returns at his second coming. The prophet Zechariah poetically pictures the reaction of Israel to his second coming. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Zechariah 12.10 On that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sin and uncleanness. Zechariah 13.1 And how sorrowful Israel will feel indeed in the presence of their king. And if one ask him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Anybody ever paid note to that verse before? You ever? <clears throat> but the atonement will be accepted. God will have a long at long last ended his separation from Israel, his original wife. The book of Hosea details the adultery of Israel in type and her final redemption and purification. Paul's words bear repeating. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Romans 11, 26. Now I believe this question has been asked in here uh, probably more than once at some point uh, during this lesson or whenever that uh, about the salvation of the Jews. <clears throat> it's like this. At the Lord's return, all of surviving Israel will be saved. But as for now, if a Jew dies prior to uh, receiving the Lord, just like if you die prior to receiving the Lord, you're going to be forever lost. And so will he. So it's important to witness to Jews as well as Gentiles. When I say surviving Israel, I mean those that survive the tribulation, which will be not be a great many. The prophet laments that uh, two-thirds of the nation will perish at the hands of the Antichrist. And now, uh, tabernacles. The prophetic picture becomes much brighter with a happy occasion of the seventh feast. Speak to the people of Israel, saying on the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. Leviticus 23, 34. God wanted to celebrate the fact that he provided shelter for all the Israelites in the wilderness. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 23, 42, and 43. Each year on tabernacles, the 15th day of the seventh month, or the seventh full moon, of the year because it's the middle of the, of the uh, month devout Jews build little shelters outside of their houses and worship in them in Jerusalem they have a, a municipal shelter 
it's provided near the Joppa Gate for the whole city to utilize. Tabernacles represents, of course, the Lord's shelter in the world to come. His great tabernacle to exist in uh, Jerusalem during the kingdom age. Th this seventh feast was commemorated faithfully by Jesus in John chapter 7. And it's the one feast that we are assured will be an important part of kingdom worship. The Lord will establish his tabernacle in Jerusalem, Ezekiel 37, 26, 27. And all the world will come every year to appear before the king and worship him. How fitting a conclusion to the festival year in the schedule of the feast. Next week, Book of Numbers. Have any questions or comments about the feast? What scripture did that come from, from about the tabernacles that uh, it will be fought? The last one? Yeah. Ezekiel 37, 26, 27. Any other questions or comments? Does this make sense to you? I hope it does. In Houston, I live a half block from the Jewish from the synagogue. So, to me, this little tidbit right here is just amazing. That they, they were in fact presenting the gospel in a Jewish Seder dinner, but they didn't know that. Yeah.